Welcome to Friday night instructor presentations. Thank you. Um, we're going to do 10 minute instructions, instructions, 10 minute presentations from our instructors. Um, we're going to try to keep it at 10 minutes tonight. Um, I got a cool flag. I'm going to raise it 10 minutes. If you make it all the way to 12 minutes, I'm going to play a rap air horn. It's going to sound like this. Well, I guess that is an incentive to go 12 minutes. Isn't it? Um, before we get going, I wanted to break the ice with my dad's favorite joke. Um, a toothless termite walked up to the bar and asked for the bartender. All right, tonight we're gonna start with Kurt Grabowski. Just let that sink in. Toothless termite. No teeth, tender bar. Anyway, Kurt Grabowski is going to be introduced by Celia Shaheen, coming from the Fiber Studio. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for making it out here tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm going to introduce Kerr, um, Bay, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi-based artist Kerr Grabowski is known for her mixed media work and elegantly whimsical wearable pieces. After 22 years in rural New Jersey, nine of them heading the fiber program at Peters Valley School of Craft, Kerr returned in 2011 to her Mississippi roots. Kerr is an enthusiastic workshop leader, fostering experimentation and play as well as technical skills. And um, she's teaching a really awesome screen printing class in the fiber studio. So come pop on by if you get the chance and let's uh, all join me in welcoming Kerr Grabowski. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Kurt Grabowski, and I coming back to Peters Valley is the most magical and amazing thing for me after being here for so long. I kind of grew up here, and I think Jen is the only one that knows more about what's been going on in the last 30 or 40 years than I do. So my class is deconstructing nature. And I, I like to teach kind of what I do. And nature has been probably starting with here, one of the main things that inspired me. So I do a lot of dyeing and printing fabric and paper and whatever happens. This is my backyard right before I left. And I'm trying to make it a native garden so that we have native things. And in Bay St. Louis, I live about five houses from the beach and about 50 miles from New Orleans. It's this funky little town that's, that's wonderful. Um, he mentioned whimsical wearables. I don't know if this is particularly whimsical, but I have done wearable clothing since the 70s. I started doing boutique clothing, doing craft shows. I love the idea of the piece not being static that when it's on a body and it's on the right body, that finishes the piece. And I try to leave room for that person, you know, to not overpower the person to make it right. This is kind of what we're teaching. It's deconstructed screen printing. It is not using any of the things of normal screen printing. We are not necessarily using stencils. We are getting multicolor prints from one pull of the squeegee. And this is something that happened because of Peters Valley. My studio was the basement of Munson. And I don't know if any of y'all have been in Munson, but there are spiders and they're, it's horrible down there, it's scary. And I didn't wanna go wash my screens, so I never washed them. And then I, I read this book by Joy Stocksdale and it said, oh, just release it, you know? So I did, so this is a painted screen with dye. And then this is a print from that screen. So you can get as many colors as you apply to your screen from one print and it's magic. You never know if it's quite right, you know, whatever. Uh, this is a jacket. It was from a show of flora and fauna from Australia to Mississippi. So there's a little cockroach in the back. Um, when I work, I work um, without much planning. I'd rather it be just what happens. So my print tables are uh, four by eight and four by 10. 
even though I do garments, I don't engineer the piece to go with the garment. I print four by eight, like I'm doing a really large painting, which keeps me happy and fresh. Then I have templates for the clothing and put them in the good parts. And whatever looks good turns into a piece of clothing. Whatever doesn't turns in, I don't know, something else. Uh, this is one print that was on the jacket prior to that. And this is kind of um, stream of consciousness, cutting and tearing newspaper, putting it down, sticking a screen on top and printing. And I like the immediacy of that kind of mark making. It's also, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it gets cut up and turns into something else. But for me, my, for my work, I'm stronger if I don't think. And as soon as you start thinking, it's like, it's surface. And so I feel like these are telling stories about myself that I don't know. And then we're, we're back to nature. So the cicadas came and the image on the left will be a scarf at some point. And I like to make the scarves and do they really, yeah, they do show up. The scarves are like long sentences. I don't think of them when I'm making them as a scarf. I think of them as pieces that relate and tell a story. So that if they're not worn, there's still a piece that has a strength, a certain strength. Um, and then <laughs> um, when I, re I moved back to Mississippi, man, the roaches there are this big and, and they fly. And they're palmetto bugs, they're not roaches. I, uh, the only way I could deal with this <laughs> was to start making pieces based on roaches. So these are like cut and torn newspaper. It's like, you know, you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, like, ah, you know. So these are roaches and these are roaches. So they got on the scarves and a local coffee shop asked me if I wanted to do an installation of roaches. So they're thread roaches. So on the right, like there, they're all thread sewn thread and I did millions of them they were crawling out of the coffee things they were all over the coffee shop and it was wonderful people really you know they bought them I sold out there was the most lucrative roach um, but it it did not solve that complete disgust when I saw roach and I want to love them I can't squish them I put glasses over them paper and take <laughs> take them outside so I have a microscope and I started putting dead roach parts under the microscope and drawing them, looking in the microscope and then kind of blind contour and not contour, drawing the roach parts. And um, that did not help, but it was fun. And then the next part I did was the way I work, you can draw on the screen with syringe filled with dye. Let that dry and then print, and it makes this type of mark. So I thought I would start printing them on manila hemp tea bags, which are strong. They're wonderful. They come with a background already. And then that led, um, and I think part of it might be my age. There's that period of bright color and pollination and then there's that beautiful period of not so bright. You've done the pollination part and you can just relax and you don't have to be bright. You can have this richness and the stuff happening that people don't have to know about. So this, the roaches on the tea bags kind of changed my color palette into this very neutral because selling clothing, they needed to be bright. We were talking about color in our house, how color sells, you know. So this new palette um, started all of this work on tea bags or manila hemp. Friends brought me their tea bags. I ironed them, I cleaned them out. So these are some of the little marks and, and marks are kind of it. You know, I mean, it's, um, if I think about what I like most, it's just being a mark maker and it's drawing and and it's as direct as you can get from your heart out your hand without a lot of technical stuff in between. Um, so I go to the beach every morning and the recent practice was to draw whatever I picked up that morning. 
and just do line drawings. So the top is a small, about like that little drawing of not necessarily the root thing that shows, but one kind of like it. And these roots would be this long. There'd be a little rhizome, then this tiny little thread holding them together kind of tenuously. And it seemed so much like community and friendships and people. And so these long roots were attached, but they could detach at any moment. I've done tons of drawings of them and it led into this piece that um, was the first big one. So this is like four feet by seven feet. And the background is all little tea bags with prints and drawings on them. And the root part was just a big die drawing of a root. And it, um, when I did it, I was thinking about the root. And later when I was working on it, um, going back to Mississippi was very difficult. Race relations and everything else were not changed in almost the 20 years I was gone. And this piece had a lot to do with my trying to come to terms with it. But this was, I made the root big and drew it with a syringe. So it would, I wanted it to drip. And I, I'm not going to say what the things mean to me. This is a detail of it. But it was really my coming to terms with a whole lot of things happening in Mississippi. And it also led into what I'm doing now. I'm not doing a lot of clothing. I'm not doing bright work. OK. Oh, uh oh, you're going to ring the flag. This is what I'm doing now. And I'm interested in layers. The top part is the piece in progress. The bottom is a detail of a little part of the top. And I'm layering sheer silk organzas, paper, whatever I work on. And it's just growing. The top part is just going to grow down until it turns into whatever it turns into. And I'm excited. I can't wait to get back to it, see what it wants to be. So this is what I'm doing currently. I like this limited palette um, a lot because I think that there's something about subtlety that can be a lot stronger than in your face. So since I haven't touched my website in 11 years, except for classes, it's kurgrabowski.com. But these things, you can kind of see what I'm doing. And that little spider was on my door. So I couldn't use the door for a while because it upset his or her little, little thing. So, but that's it. Thank you very much. You didn't raise the flag. You were doing so well though. <laughs> Thank you, Kerr. That was excellent. Um, did y'all hear the rumor about the butter? The butter. No, I'm not going to spread it. <laughs> All right, next up um, from the Fine Metal Studio is Paul Nielsen with Maddie Meyer introducing. All righty, hey everybody. So I'm Maddie Meyer. Um, I'm the assistant in the Fine Metal Studio. And I'm here to introduce the one and only Pave Paul Nielsen. Um, so Paul received his BFA from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. Um, and after his first semester, or not first, but his last semester, he got the, yeah, he got his job on Jewelers Row in Philadelphia, and he's been setting stones ever since. Um, he currently has his own studio on Jewelers Row in Philadelphia, and has also been teaching classes at Peters Valley for about 13 years. Um, right now, he is teaching an introduction to stone setting um, course. So please help me in welcoming Paul. Flag ready. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul. Um, which button do I push? Uh, just the arrows. The just right arrow. This right there. Right. The oh, there we go. So, jewelry. Um, I started out in junior college uh, carving, sculpture. I did a lot of sculpture um, later in life uh, before I 
got back to jewelry as well. Um, I was a teacher, taught sculpture, 3D design, and jewelry, and loved it. I fell in love. I always carved things, even when I was a little kid. So it translated well to jewelry. And a lot of people will come to me and see um, grandmother's rings, inherited stuff, take it apart, put it back together into something that you actually want or you can wear, something maybe a little more modern. So here, somebody gives me a ring, and you can see that up on the left. Um, I deconstruct it, take uh, some wax model, uh, start carving, um, take all these measurements, produce it into the images you see below. And then later on in another picture, there's uh, the finished product. But um, that's always been my passion, is creating things from whatever you got. And I've always had a real passion for stones. Um, and um, here's another one where you can see the scale that I can work with. Um, so yeah, that little carving fits on the head of a dime and it actually fits on my pinky nail. So I'm pretty meticulous with everything I do. Um, it's a little time consuming at times. It's also a little strenuous on your vision, but I have my little cheater glasses and it works out really well. Um, another commission where someone inherited more stones and just wing it, just give me what you got. So I'll see stones either lay out if I have a specific number. Um, I was always into math when I was a kid through the, those geographic drawings or uh, geometric drawings and um, still play around with the, the play of light and color and shape. Um, so a lot of people will give me drawings. So someone went to QVC, bought a whole bunch of stones. My friend Lori, who's a, my photographer also, um, drew up this picture. This guy wanted an eye of Horus for his, his wife, gave me all the stones he had from QVC, um, 3 a.m. purchases, great, great deals, by the way. Um, and this is what she came up with. I think about this. And she did all the color placement, and everything else. I took this, laid it on a piece of wax and hand carved everything. And then in the end, all the fine details were all with the engraving tools we're using in the studio up uh, there this weekend. So everyone will learn a little bit about engraving. Um, engage it ring, blah, blah, blah. Um, I just have to throw that in there. So this is where I get to where I am. This is pave, a lot of pave. That one on the top left is typically what you see if you get your wedding band and it is plain, you come to me and say, load me up. Give me a bunch of diamonds. And that's what I do. So that ring itself on the top left has, I think that's uh, seven rows of diamonds. There are 36 rows or 36 diamonds in each row, which roughly translates to about 256 diamonds in an eight millimeter strip wide, yada, yada, yada. Over the course of my career, you can imagine if I do that in a day, how many diamonds I've seen over my lifetime. And all the diamonds that I've seen in my lifetime under three millimeters thick. So the next one, top right, was, hey, I want to get married. My wife wants something or my girlfriend wants something. What do you want? See the billboard outside? It's like, yes, that's what she wants. Okay, so you copy it and do that. Um, the one on the bottom left is all fake. So you don't need everything to be real to get something. It's about design. If you have a good design, you can make a great product. The one on the right, I had to custom fit the two bands on the bottom woman was in a car accident, they had to cut the ring off her finger, turn the top into a pendant, and then years later, I want my ring back. So she gave it to me, and then I incorporated the same design style in the ring itself onto the bands, all through engraving with the tools that we're using today, up in the studio this weekend. More kind of uh, technical stuff. The lower left one is that same one from the very beginning, all finished and complete. Somebody's antique um, aquamarine and rubies, and I like doing things where you can make an illusion of more than what you actually have. So those rubies on the side with a mirror finish create the illusion of four on each side as opposed to two. So that's always a nice little process. And then that top one on the left is really nice because it's really technical being two cha three channels and then the baguettes having a nice corner to them, having to know that you have to have the stones fit and the channel fit properly to not break anything and cost you a couple hundred, if not thousands of dollars. So then you get into Pave without the diamonds. So this was my Naked Pave series because one day I was doing this setting and drilling and laying out the stones and I thought, man, this just looks cool by itself. And I thought, I can do this without anything in it and it's gonna save me so much time. And it still looks great. And I have a, a, another piece up in the studio that's coming up next, but it was a big hit. 
And people looked at it, it's like, how do you do that? You take every single one of those holes, get the stone, it's the beads raised over, then you take your cut in between so that all you see are diamonds and little pieces of metal. And um, these are, I, I love doing this. It's just sitting there and drilling, making sure you measure everything out millimeter by millimeter by millimeter. And then you get something like this, which is again, flashback to my youth when I used to do those optical illusion drawings in design class. So I love them. And I had these in circles, triangles, and squares. So when I start to do the pave, this is how I do the layout. So you can see the original, somebody comes, hey, can you spice up my ring? I have to do the layouts and then drill everything like the previous picture and then set them to finish like that. So that's where all the pave comes into play. And what we're doing up in the class, you can see some of the detail. So you know how things are set. Some have four little beads on there, those two little pieces of metal. Some have four, um, two, you know, however many you need to, to keep the stone secure. So a little progress shot, you bring me your wedding band, you get your diamonds from her, come to me and say, Paul, do your thing. So I start by getting my dividers, lay out a pattern, a little line down the middle, find the middle, there's four rows here, and mark each individual spot. I take and I drill each individual spot. And I start by setting my first stone, two beads. Then I set an entire row and then mark on each side of the row where the next set of diamonds go. Start filling it in and you have your complete ring. So something like this, one row could probably take if there's let's say 40 stones, an hour, maybe a little over an hour. So in the better part of an afternoon, you can come and get your diamond blinged up or your ring blinged up. And then when you really wanna be blingy, set like 300 diamonds in a heart. So this is all the real technical aspect of everything that I've done. And then I told the class that when I started out as college, I was a production setter and somebody would give me a bag of hundred bracelets and all the diamonds that go with it. And it got to the point where you set 50 stones at a time and one bracelet, you do 12 bracelets in an hour, 600 diamonds an hour times a day, times a month, times a year. I've seen a lot of, a lot of diamonds. And I've seen a lot of other nice stones particularly when people come to me and bring their stuff to be remade. So a friend's mom came and had all this old jewelry from her ex, said, melt that shit down. And sorry, if you could use the horn for that one. Um, and make me something nice. So she came up with a couple of designs she liked and it's just melting gold for the accents, creating the sterling as the base and coming with a really nice design that she was really happy with. So the next one, a friend of mine uh, was in Florida. He bought a lot of stones that were just, um, you know, cheap as can be saw this big blue stone and he and his wife thought oh it looks like this you know view of the earth from the sky you know there's some clouds there's some land there's the water what can you do for us so of course earth moon sun sky i started by carving a moon and that's all hand done with the birds that we have in the class cutting out the sun and the the uh, flames starting to soldering everything together so there's the bezel the stone on the left the bezel that's made and it's lasered and soldered. So we had a laser welder, lasered that together. Bottom was soldered together and you can start to see where I put the clouds in as well. And then started to laser on the sun. And then once it's polished and all together, we have our sun, we have the moon and the night sky with some diamonds and our single ornaments that we'll be doing also. The clouds, all of those are fabricated and soldered and then lasered onto the bracelet itself and the bezel and then the stone itself. And it's a really wonderful piece, it's heavy, but it's, I mean, she's a smaller woman. And so it's its small for a bracelet, but uh, pretty commanding uh, in, uh, in stature. So I love stones. I am a stone hoarder. I've ordered so many stones in the past year during everything that happened. I don't know where I got the money to do it, but I have them and they're fantastic. And you have to make stuff. And one thing I love are druzies. So, when I see stones, I get an image and a picture and I have a, I know what I want to do with it right away. So this one, it's called silver lining. Um, the druzy is the cloud. There is a citrine sun, 18 karat gold uh, lightning bolt. And then the rain is aquamarine, briolet, white topaz, moonstones, and um, 14 karat white gold to hold everything in place. And it moves. Is, can we, is there a way to... Oh, here we go. Do I press enter? Return? Hey, there we go. 
So it's very, it moves a lot and it's wonderful. Um, if I do say so myself. So another one, somebody comes to my shop, you see a stone you like, give me a design. My friend picked the stone, she drew the image, I cut it out, pierced it, soldered it, put it together. I told you, get the flag ready. So, and not just for jewelry, you know, on your chest, your rings, whatever, I made a crown. So yeah, crown's cool. Um, my mom's church, hey, we wanna give the bridge of Mary something for whatever celebration that is in, you know, Catholicism and in May, Mother's Day maybe. And can you do something? All of this that's in this piece is old person jewelry that was donated to the church for whatever reason. And I just took it out and I didn't do whatever we do, you know, in the studio, but um, it was a wonderful project to work on, something I'd never done, but I cast a flask this big, that high in the foundry and had my students help me do this. And it was just a serious undertaking, but it turned out phenomenal. I was just so proud and happy to do it. And that's just a detail of how things work without any of the actual technical stuff. Everything's epoxied in, nothing's fallen out yet, and Mary loves it. And that's the end of my story. So, thank you. <laughs> this will do it if you want. No, it'll take too long. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, OK. Um, when I was preparing for this presentation, I found a website called countryliving.com. And they have an article called 145 Dad Jokes That Are Actually Funny, which is where I got some of these, I'll be totally honest. Um, how do you find Will Smith in the snow? How? You follow the Fresh Prince. <laughs> All right, up next, from the ceramic studio, Jessica Thompson being introduced by Molly Kate Geddes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Molly Kate Geddes. I'm from the ceramic studio here, and I'm going to be introducing Jess Thompson. She received her BFA in painting and drawing from Penn State and MFA in ceramics from Alfred University in New York. She teaches at Minnesota College in coastal northern California. Um, Jess is a lifelong meditation and yoga practitioner and tends to have curating projects and environmental activism going on on the side. Um, she's a mother of two little boys and co-directs the Flynn Creek Pottery Studio and artist residency with her husband and wood fire pottery, Nick Schwartz, who was just here last week. So please give a warm welcome to Jess. Here, I've got one. What do you call a rooster staring at a pile of lettuce? Chicken sees a salad. <laughs> <laughs> My eight-year-old decided he has to learn how to tell jokes. And uh, so we had to do some research because it was kind of bad. <laughs> oh, in such a beautiful way. Um, okay. So anyway, after I got that, that BFA from painting from Penn State, I decided to become a potter. And my family was mystified because my dad's family for um, five generations had been in, uh, industrial ceramic factory workers. And um, the last thing they wanted was for me to forsake my college education that they had dearly paid for and, and go back to this blue collar life. Um, and so I did a, um, a four year production apprenticeship in utilitarian pottery. And I tried to figure out every possible way I could to get images onto the pottery including piling them on, you know, excessively like the last one onto these poor little pots. Um, and eventually found that I had to keep moving back up in scale in order to get that sort of um, giant canvas like I really had loved um, working on. And my mom is an interior designer, so I was also really interested in pattern. So sometimes, you know, I'll do some pattern, but I really like the story and I started making really big pots. So these pots are getting up to like, this one's like about 48 inches tall. And the last one was like, I don't know, maybe like this. And, um, and <clears throat> this one's called allegory of home. And you can see, so there's like the colonial home from Ohio and they're the vineyards of California. And so, you know, I'd gone from my industrial roots, kind of sort of Midwestern roots into this groovy California life. So we got the coastal scenes and then around the other side, there's some temples and such. And so this is what we're 
working on this weekend is um, basically making a giant round canvas that turns on itself continuously. And um, because I really feel like our lives are, uh, are made up of many disparate images that come from many different places and experiences. And I really enjoy the act of sort of letting that, those memories spiral back on each other again and again, because the pot is continuous. And that's the way it's built on the wheel is with a spiral. Um, so in a clay pot, you know, we've got the full gamut of possibilities. We've got the bare clay, of uh, the color of the clay itself, I mean. Uh, we've got tools to incise imagery into, carve into the walls. We've got um, low relief, high relief, three dimensions, um, anything we can brush on color. And um, so, yeah, as you can see here, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I haven't gotten out much in the last year and a half. How about you guys? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's really exciting to be here though. Um, so like these pots this weekend, we're using red clay underneath because it has this wonderful vibrant color and the white slip and then under glazes at a mid range temperature. Um, and we're, we can just layer the colors like paint and it's, it's, it's nice for just sort of embarking on this kind of thing. Um, but in the last decade or so, especially with my children in the studio, crawling around on the floor, <laughs> they're older now, but I got rid of everything toxic and I'm really trying to let the clay itself and its color range speak. And I, I use mostly local clay at home and some just simple white clays for certain pieces. And, but, and also as, as the pots got bigger, I had to start asking like, why am I doing this to these poor pots? <laughs> You know, they're not really functioning as pots. Maybe they're starting to function more as architecture or um, ceremonially, you know, in a domestic setting. And beyond that, for me, they, in, in traditional cultures, they might function as a sacred piece. And um, I like sacred more than the word spiritual because sacred just means what's most important to each person. And it doesn't have to be uh, spiritual necessarily. Um, so, you know, I kind of, I like the idea of the space of the temple and I like the image of the she-wolf. Um, I tend to be a little um, critical of <laughs> modern culture. We live in the woods, we live in the redwoods and, you know, we heat our home with wood and we fire our kilns with wood. And, and um, so looking out from that towards all these new developments, um, I have a lot of questions, but I like the image of the she-wolf, especially as a mom now. So the last, slide with the she-wolf. I was nursing for about five years straight of my life, if you can tell. And so I like this idea that like these animals, the animals have a right to be a little angry, you know? And so I like the guardian animals and uh, as far as like the architecture of the temple. This is a piece that um, where you can walk into the piece and it's called the last fall. So it's as though the apples have fallen from the tree of knowledge and it's been cut down for firewood. So you walk in and maybe you're the stump, maybe this was done to you, maybe you're the, maybe you were holding the ax, I don't know. It's like the human who walks in is really the most important human in my installations. I don't really use um, sculpt figures because I think that the person viewing it is the most important person in it. And then I have, I have all sorts of ideas because I have children, I have tons of ideas for monumental installations and I make a lot of maquettes, <laughs> I make a lot of parts. But so one of them is like a whole orchard full of stumps with angry she-wolves emerging from them. Super ambitious. Um, this, this was just one that came out of that idea. And I, I really love throwing the parts of my installations. I, um, I did a long production apprenticeship. And, and so that's the best way I have to produce things quickly. And it's really satisfying. Again, I love the spiral. So, um, you know, the apples are all thrown. There they are. They're thrown like little bottles and then pinched at the top. And they're really nice and full of air, <laughs> like juicy. And um, there's the snake and some other little details and forms that I like. I like the, the Garden of Eden idea and this fall um, of humanity. Really kind of curious about that as far as like a source narrative for us. Um, and the snake, I'm pretty scared of snakes personally. I mean, I love animals, but as far as animals go, I'm not really that into snakes. 
but I like how they function in stories. And I think it's also really important as artists to make things about things that we don't like because it's as suggestive and perhaps even more so about where you might need to go in your life than the things you really do like. Um, because yeah, there's a whole world of things that we're not thinking about other than our myopic vision. So again, this one, I really want it to be huge. I wanna make a whole writhing wall of them and name it like Congress or something. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I think that's gonna be one of my next pieces, the big one. Um, um, I like the idea of the altar as a nice container for um, a group of objects that don't necessarily go together um, expressly, but that are important to each one of us. So I like just, you know, setting up this pedestal and then placing a few of these objects together to, I don't know, examine their importance. I also like the idea of these pieces looking as though they came from, they might've come from the past. They might've, something might've just happened. They might be in the future there, or just this idea of a fallen temple. It's kind of like a Margaret Atwood novel is an example I really like because you're never quite sure if the dystopia is happening right now in a, you know, everyday sort of city environment or whether it happened in the 60s or whether it's going to happen in the future. And I really like that ambiguity because I think it calls into question our responsibility as far as like avoiding such things, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Anyway, that's getting a little complex. But um, I love um, the Renaissance painting, but I especially like things that are a little less idealized like the Dutch Renaissance tradition of the vanitas or natura morte, you know, the death of nature, which, you know, there's always a skull and a half empty hourglass and some half eaten food and crumbs and flies buzzing around. And so we, we gravitate towards it because it fits into our tradition of beauty. People are attracted to it. And then you get up close and it's kind of like, ooh, not really going right. You know, it's about mortality and um, fallibility. Um, but meanwhile, ever since the Neolithic Revolution, we continue to accumulate stuff. And I'm always asking, like, why am I making more stuff? And also, I really um, like to, I like the way things just accumulate naturally. I like my pieces when, not necessarily when they're staged in a gallery, but when they're just stacked on the tables, staged, because I feel like that's a really natural arrangement of things. I often like them better that way. Um, so anyway, speaking of that natural order of things, um, at a certain, oh, I'm over time. Okay, almost there. But <laughs> while doing all this clay work, it's really, it's heavy stuff. It was really hard on your body. So I did a lot of yoga, study, study, study. Uh, I became a teacher. And then finally I was like, you know what? This stuff works really well. And I'm not so sure about contemporary art making. That tends to be really confusing. Sometimes it's a downer. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. I love it. But um, so I went to Nepal because I was like, I want to find out why people make things even when they're struggling to survive. And I want to find out why they believe that those things are important and sacred. So I did. I lived there for a couple months and in the Himalayas. It was wonderful. And I came back and found a teacher just by happenstance living two hours south of me. So this is one of his pieces. And so now I'm apprenticing. I'm a student again. And my teacher is a Tibetan Tonka painter, and I, I'm really enjoying it. This is one of my drawings that's got the sacred, the grid of sacred geometry underlying it. And this was the finished Tonka. I don't know if it's possible to zoom, but um, yeah, I think it's just really important for us to be carrying down old skills down through time. So just by being here, you're making a really valid contribution to culture and the preservation of old skills. So. Everyone here at Peter's Valley is going to be fine when the toilet paper runs out. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jess. Got one more presentation. So I've got one more joke. Um, this one I was workshopping a lot today. So if you know the answer, don't blurt it out because it's my joke. Um, why do elephants use their trunks? Why? Because they don't have glove compartments. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, last up from the Wood Studio is Wyatt Sievers. Sievers. 
Um, introducing him is, it's them, Kat Nash. <laughs> Hello all. <laughs> Um, I'm Kat Nash. I'm the wood assistant here to introduce Wyatt Stevers, who is teaching the designing and building fine furniture class this week. Wyatt is a studio artist currently living in Western Kentucky with his partner, where they're working on building out their studios. Wyatt is a craft school junkie, and his love for craft schools and woodworking began here at Peters Valley in 2006, when he took a class with Stephen Proctor. He has returned to Peters Valley multiple times since, and has had my current job as assistant twice, and even stayed in my room in Hilltop when he was here. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming to a Peters Valley legend, Wyatt Sievers. Hi, Peters Valley. It's really great to be here. Thank you all for being here. I love the Valley. It's, who's uh, first time is it here? Yeah, awesome. Well, it won't be your last. Um, so yeah, I um, kind of got my start here and got addicted to craft school in that like week long, like we're going to cram a semester of knowledge down you and you'll digest it, put it to work when you get home. Um, so yeah, we're building furniture, we're designing furniture. It's a great class. Everybody's project is completely different. So we're all going to learn from each other. Um, so yeah, let's see, I have some furniture here. This first one, it's a hall table. It's the sofa table. I like making small tables. I like making things that look like bricks. They're lots of little pieces. It's kind of like just uh, paying homage to the fact that we know how to make stuff and um, so I embed it into the bigger stuff. And it's kind of like behind the scenes of what's holding that thing up. Um, so more bricks, another hall table, um, just like the problem solving of woodworking, of um, drawing something and then figuring out how to make it, how to make it archival. It needs to go to last a few hundred years. Um, or at least until the buyer gets it home, whichever comes first, you know. Um, this is a, a piece that I thought I was gonna start doing like furniture with like plants and trees and stuff. I haven't made another one yet, but it's still on the to-do list. Uh, I can't really tell. There's some metal work in there, little copper, silver inlay, um, drawer handles, lots more bricks. The tree is dead right now, I have to admit that but um, so maybe I'll make a piece of furniture out of it on a small level. Um, so this is a bench. Um, it's called Benchmark because it was kind of like one of my first big painted pieces. This is covered in milk paint. Um, it's not a natural edge. It is um, veneer on plywood. And I went back in and cut it to sort of that natural shape. It's being held up by some bricks. There's some metal um little forged uh bolts running through it they're completely unnecessary but i think they look good um there's like 300 stainless steel screws inside of there just having fun over building and just spending time with myself i think that's what a lot of us may begin to art to do is just like hang out and meditate in our studio and then get out and share it and hang out with all these cool people and um, pass that craft on. It is really awesome to be passed and on like hand skills and knowledge that is dying out of the world. That's one thing I really love about it. Um, a chair, it's pretty comfortable. Um, an older chair, I just remade a taller version of this chair. This is why I've been working on through COVID. So it's bar stool height. Um, you see the back is bolted on with some bolts. It's pretty comfy because the whole thing flexes. You can lean back in this chair and you're not gonna break it. Um, and it's got some really ornate English walnut burl. There's six of these and they all book match each other. I'm waiting on the real photographer to show up for him. But yeah, that's what I've been doing during COVID along with a few other things I'll show you. Um, let's see here. So I make uh, some of these uh, turned based things. Um, I like going from the furniture that takes um, a month or it ends up taking three or four months, just depending on it. Um, and then I'll go to the lathe and I'll turn, and I'll do a little simple carving and painting to get away from that really long process. Um, so this is a bindle. Does everybody know what a bindle is? You know, that's your, your stick and handkerchief, all your stuff tied up for wandering. Um, yeah. Um, this is a turned piece of cherry. 
it's kind of uh, catch it as it as it comes by. If you're familiar with wood turning, you're sticking this piece of sharp metal into the spinning chunk of wood that might be 10 pounds or several hundred. Um, so it's kind of like touching a fan blade without sticking your finger in between it. A little bit of woodworking could be like adrenaline junkie stuff. Um, little piece called Judas Ram. Um, that's about two feet tall. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a little narrative piece from a Utah Phillips song. He's one of my inspirations. You should look up that guy if you don't know who he is. Uh, and then um, kind of this is also turning and lightly carved, trying to go from that, you know how it was made to how is that made. Um, it's got a sandblasted texture on it. Um, wood is really awesome when you sandblast it. Do it if you haven't tried it. Uh, and this uh, it's a fractal piece, just kind of like mathematician, like tearing things uh, or cutting into things and seeing what you can, you can do. Um, this one is about to be in an auction of another craft school. If you want to buy it, it's gonna. Um, so then I, I do these large scale turnings. So, you know, that's about that size. It's a little video, maybe. There it goes. Um, so something like that, you know, it's four or 500 pounds to start. And it's not about making something big for me. It's really about, I have this beautiful, huge um, log and I hate to cut it down into these little things. Um, so like, as of right now, like the, the ash borer is ripping the trees out of our, off the world. Um, so I've gotten these huge pieces of ash. Now that's about three feet across. Um, so it's a, a big ash bowl. And uh, so, and this one is uh, about the same size. A lot of times this 1945 revisited, I like to title like these bowls, you know, because they're, they're shapes and sometimes they have a narrative, sometimes they don't. But I'm really, uh, when I'm working in wood, I love to think about the fact that it's this tree that's been here before me. It could be here after me, but I cut it down. I'm reconciling with that. I can um, count the rings of a tree and find out when it sprouted. And it's like for this particular one, yeah, I figured out within a year or two, but I'm pretty positive this tree sprouted in 1945. And then here I am, this like punk, whatever, 30 year old kid um, in my wood shop, cutting it up, turning something out of it. And it's like this ancient, beautiful thing that's been like given oxygen and nuts and um, places for birds and squirrels to live forever. I'm just, you know, making something out of it. Um, I'm working on that. Um, and this is the one that you saw in that video. It's called Emerald Death because it's the emerald beetle that's been taking out the, uh, the ash trees. Uh, so I do a lot of this wood turning when I get really tired of a piece of furniture that I've been like working on for three months. And then something that I really love is teaching and I love teaching us when we're smaller and older. So I have this traveling um, turn-in studio that I pack up and unpack and do youth programming around. So if you don't have a turn-in studio in your town, you could. Um, and then I do a furniture class with kids where we build things out of these sticks. If you kind of see where these are all kind of similar pieces, they're made from surveying sticks that a friend gave me several pallets of. So this is another youth class. And then during COVID, um, I did this. I bought a building in Alabama. I called my partner. She was at home for Thanksgiving, visiting her parents. I was like, hey, I bought a building. Don't kill me. <laughs> We're gonna tear it down. So in a few trips, um, we, we figured out how to deconstruct a 60 year old still building. And so it's currently in the yard of our home. Uh, we're trying to figure out where exactly we need to build this kind of forever studio. And um, she's really sweet for putting up with me. But, uh, you know, it, it goes around. Uh, we just uh, moved 60,000 pounds of bricks and we're going to build her wood kiln. So, um, yeah, when you're an artist, sometimes it's really heavy. It's heavy on the mind and physical. But um, so anyway, it's a pleasure to be back here teaching, hanging out. Um, come see us. We'll come see you. And uh, thanks a lot. Eight minutes.
All right. Thank you all for coming. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but it was actually a really fun night. So thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.